Welcome viewers to this series of lectures on modern European history. We have earlier spoken of the proceedings or set of events and processes that characterize the history of Europe, modern Europe ever since the beginning of the French Revolution in 1789. We spoke of the three stages of the revolution. We spoke of the rise of Napoleon. We spoke of the Napoleonic Empire. We spoke of the defeat of Napoleon around 1814-15 and the uh, Congress at Vienna that deliberated upon the future political order of Europe, where we said that uh, the uh, arrangement that was made for Europe uh, in the post-1815 period at Vienna was one which was quite traditional and uh, you can say even reactionary in the sense that it put the clock back to pre-1789 times and uh, whichever area was governed by whichever monarch uh, was called upon to rule over that area. And if obviously uh, the people from that line are not alive, then the subsequent uh, inheritors or heirs to the throne were entrusted with that task. So, that was basically a kind of a conservative uh, reactionary response that we get to see in this phase from 1815 down to the middle of the 19th century in Europe. And this particular discussion is uh, in a very restricted sense of what was happening in Britain from 1815 to 1830 and we will be talking about the liberal gains that were made in Britain during this uh, period that is these uh, 15, uh, 20 years. Now, again uh, you would serve your cause of understanding what I am saying better if you, uh, if you recall that 19th century European history is essentially about an interplay of liberalism, nationalism and socialism. So, it, 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 they, constitutes, they, they constitute the three, uh, uh, I would say, historical coordinates of whatever was happening in Europe. So, the liberals are fast uh, trying to assert themselves through the creation of some kind of a republican state. They did not mind if it was a monarchy from the top, but a constitutional monarchy that would safeguard their interest. And their interest was, say, free trade, their interest was uh, individualism, their uh, interest uh, lay in some liberal reforms, their interest lay in uh, liberal uh, policy and the state keeping away from uh, the business which is uh, laissez fair and so forth. They were not interested in uh, genuine democracy and enfranchisement of all uh, people or all the uh, uh, citizens or subjects under a particular monarch. right? So, but at the same time, uh, the process of industrialization was also impacting all areas of Europe and since we are talking in particular about Britain, obviously the impact of industrialization was completely transforming the social landscape of Britain as well. It was creating or it was adding to the uh, number of the working class and they were also getting organized, uh, although they had not been able to emerge during this period, these uh, 15 years that we are talking about, 1815 to 1830, as an independent historical agency, but subsequently they would. So, uh, till around this, uh, uh, this moment, we will discover that uh, whatever rumblings that are there in the working class uh, or the people uh, 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 in the lower rungs of society that is creating that tension, that is creating that uh, uh, sense of fear in the ruling class, but uh, somehow they are not able to realize uh, a kind of political order 
which is tailored to suit their interests. It is the liberals who are able to uh, wade their way through in terms of consolidating and even furthering what they thought would serve their interest better. So, it, it is through these uh, incremental gains that liberalism uh, is, uh, is getting permeated, is getting spread uh, in, in greater parts of uh, Britain. So, if you look at the period from 1783 to 1832 in Britain, you have the dominance of the conservative Tory party. Uh, they had two parties, uh, Tories and the Whigs. Uh, Tories were regarded as a little more conservative than the Whigs, who happened to be their political opponents. Uh, they were supposed to be, the Whigs were supposed to be uh, more progressive uh, uh, and, and they were a little more conciliatory to France. But when it came to safeguarding their class interest, in terms of liberalism and not giving it all away to the popular pressure from people on the street, the working class. Even the Whigs displayed that dash of, uh, that dash of uh, I would say, conservatism as the Tories did. So, uh, they ended up uh, being uh, equally unsympathetic as the Tories to any democratic notions uh, uh, and also uh, in uh, defending their rights uh, to the full limits of their property. So, that class character that underpinned uh, both these parties despite the optics of being conservative and progressive is very much at play during this period and this becomes evident at critical points uh, of history. Uh, of Britain during this period. For example, there were uh, several instances of rioting after 1815, particularly uh, in the northern uh, part of uh, Britain, uh, in cities like Manchester, uh, you had huge uh, number of working class uh, and uh, the number of radicals uh, was also quite substantial over here and uh, the situation also uh, was that of uh, economic depression and unemployment. Obviously, uh, uh, it was a very, uh, very uh, conducive climate for working class unrest and uh, uh, that is what gave uh, some kind of uh, a milieu for the instances of rioting uh, around 1815 that we get to see in Britain in uh, particularly in its northern part. Uh, and when it came to the government, uh, that is the Tories who were uh, in power at this point of time, obviously uh, these uh, strikes, these writings, uh, where these riots were put down with heavy hand and uh, the Whigs uh, instead of uh, vehemently opposing these government measures tacitly supported uh, these measures because as I said that the class character was, uh, was uh, at play uh, and it is the uh, middle class uh, gains that uh, either of the parties do not want to lose control of. They do not want that uh, the consolidations in terms of liberal rights uh, should be squandered that way and therefore there is that uh, uh, there is that consolidation of uh, liberal rights or uh, liberal principles that's happening despite uh, the optics of uh, uh, different parties uh, be it uh, tories or the whigs in 1819 just to uh, recount uh, some of the instances uh, that characterized this period, a crowd of 60,000 uh, people demonstrated for political reforms at St. Peter's Field and uh, it was a huge gathering and the sense of unrest was very palpable and look at the government response, they were fired upon by the so uh, by uh, soldiers leading in uh, several uh, 
of these protesters getting killed. Uh, so much so that the British radicals uh, started calling it Peter Blue, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, remindful of uh, Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, right? So uh, it, it, they, they, they caricatured this um, in terms of intensity and uh, damage to human lives uh, through this word Peter Lou. And uh, that's the response that the working class is uh, getting. Uh, in in uh, in Britain at around this point of time, and uh, the liberals who are having access to the levers of power through these two parties uh, are uh, somewhat consolidating whatever liberal gains that they had made vis-a-vis -vis the aristocracy, the landed aristocracy, uh, uh, who was fast losing. Uh, its control over uh, over uh, the matters of uh, governance or economic clout. Uh, there were several other uh, measures of repression, for example, six acts uh, and the increase uh, in the stamp tax on newspapers. All these things uh, are repressive measures, uh, not only uh, uh, for the uh, people down below, uh, the artisans, the working class, but even for uh, the middle class, uh, it did not augur well. And uh, nevertheless, the British leadership displayed a remarkable ability uh, time and again to compromise, to accommodate. And therefore, they could avoid building up of a situation like it did in France, some kind of a revolutionary situation. Remember, Earlier, I have spoken to you about the 1830 revolution in France. Now, nothing of that sort is happening in Britain because whenever situation starts deteriorating or the tension or uh, stress is very much visible uh, so far as the working class is concerned, then the ruling class, the British leadership uh, comes out with some kind of an accommodation and compromise. And that is how... Uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know uh, way out uh, of that tension is uh, made and it does not lead to some kind of a uh, irreconcilable uh, revolutionary situation as it got built uh, say in France. So uh, showing sensitivity the ruling class showed sensitivity also to the liberal minded capitalists and entrepreneurs uh, by retreating from the commitment uh, to quintuple alliance that uh, had been made by Britain post-1815, post the Vienna Congress. Now, what was this quintuple alliance? I have earlier spoken to you about this, uh, uh, about uh, the Vienna Congress uh, in 1814-1815, where in order to uh, perpetuate or in order to uh, make the arrangement that they had made at Vienna that is reinstating monarchy or monarchical order in greater part of Europe, these countries, several uh, countries including Britain had made alliance with several other monarchies that if there is any rumbling or there is any unrest at the behest of uh, the radicals or they try to topple the uh, monarch or monarchical arrangement or political arrangement that had been solidified at Vienna, then these countries would send their forces, they would come together to support the arrangement that had been made at uh, Vienna. Now, this commitment had been made, but I have uh, referred to this in my earlier discussion with you that uh, when it came to the uh, say commercial interest or class interest of the middle class who were traders and uh, were also trying to uh, uh, penetrate the colonies in South America and you had Napoleonic uh, continental system in place. So, the South American colonies 
actually could start trading with the British, right? Now, this was to the detriment of the monarchies who had their colonial interest in South American colonies. But as I said that the uh, commercial interest is fast uh, becoming more colossal and it just could not uh, stand uh, or, or this quintuple alliance commitment uh, could not stand in the way of the, uh, the push for profit, the uh, demand for profit and things are transforming. So, uh, British uh, retreat from uh, at the policy level, British retreat from quintuple alliance is something that, uh, that was welcomed by the liberal minded capitalist uh, entrepreneurs who looked at the South American colonies as, uh, as a site from where they could uh, trade with and earn profit from. So, Apart from these uh, trading activities back home, uh, capital punishment was abolished for a host of crimes and that is another facet of liberalism and uh, that is a more humane kind of legal system that they wanted to make. They wanted to decriminalize quite a few uh, say economic offenses and uh, dehumanizing uh, ways in which punishments were uh, met out. Those things were obviously opposed by the liberals and uh, something that was redolent of the monarchical times, the traditional times that were done away with. So, that is another phase of liberalism that you get to see through these uh, reform measures. The court laws were further liberalized. Now, what were these court laws in Britain? Uh, Britain consumed corn and uh, not uh, the entire quantum of uh, internal consumption of Britain was made uh, in Britain obviously, but uh, the tariff walls were raised just to give some kind of a cushion to the landholders, the, uh, land, uh, the land holding class, so that whatever corn that they produce in uh, Britain get sold at a competitive price because the tariff walls were so high that any import of corn from other parts of Europe would or, or uh, even, even uh, outside Europe should not enter and disturb the profit cushion of the land holding class. So, it was a kind of uh, cocoon kind of a uh, market uh, uh, that uh, landlords got for whatever corn that they produced. So, it was a secure market for them and imports were, uh, were uh, inhibited by high tariff walls. The industrialists, the entrepreneurs, the middle class. Uh, who had invested in uh, trade and uh, industrial activities obviously did not want this tariff wall to be very high. They wanted it to be brought down because if the corn laws in Britain or if the corn prices in Britain are brought down, what happens is that the bread prices would also come down and bread prices was critical to working out the wages that the industrial class had to dole out to the working class, to the workers, to the industrial workers. So, industrial workers wages were pegged to corn, uh, were pegged to bread prices which was essential for their survival and bread prices were high because the corn prices in Britain were high and corn prices in Britain were high because the tariff walls were high. So, obviously the industrial class wanted these tariff walls to be brought down. So, that if the prices in internal market of Britain uh, become very high, they could rather resort to import of corn and that would stabilize the bread prices and that would mean that uh, the profit margin of the industrialists uh, or the capitalists or the entrepreneurs uh, does not suffer adversely. So, it was essentially 
some kind of a squabble between uh, the landlords and the manufacturers. And here you find that by uh, liberalizing the corn laws, uh, the ruling class in uh, Britain is actually assuaging, uh, is, uh, is assuaging the uh, interest of uh, the manufacturers and uh, landlords are at the receiving end. Yet, should we call uh, this, uh, uh, this period as very progressive uh, for uh, the middle class uh, or uh, in general uh, very conducive for progressive uh, uh, onset of reforms and so forth? No. The conservatives did not reform the system of representation in the House of Commons. Remember, the middle class which was otherwise doing financially very well, economically very well, uh, had to wait for a couple of more generations uh, to have access to the levers of political power. So, in terms of representation in the House of Commons, it is still the landlords, the traditional class that was calling shots. And uh, whatever reforms were made were minuscule and uh, uh, the landlord uh, clout in uh, parliament of Britain was uh, very visible uh, despite several economic gains made by the middle class in terms of liberal reforms and laws and policies and so forth. So, uh, this was uh, the landlord interest in the House of Commons was loaded in favor of uh, the landed interest. In fact, uh, about uh, two third of the members uh, of the House of Commons uh, had directly or indirectly landed class patronage. Uh, they were even uh, derided as rotten or pocket borrows of uh, landed magnates. So, they, they might not uh, visibly, these representatives in the House of Commons might not visibly be landlords, but uh, actually uh, they were working for them, right? And that is why these, uh, these epithets like rotten or pocket borrows and so forth. And uh, they were the ones who tried to argue that landed interest is equal to national interest. So, uh, the idea of uh, national interest uh, was sought to be uh, was sought to be uh, put as some kind of a, a cover to safeguard landed interest and that is how, uh, uh, that's how uh, in a very nuanced way these uh, representatives in the House of Commons were operating for the landed interest and that is why I said that uh, despite several uh, political and uh, economic gains, uh, despite several uh, social and uh, economic gains. Uh, their access, middle class access to uh, politics or to, to levers of political power had to wait for a couple of more generations. Nevertheless, spurred by the examples of liberal reform, uh, reformers in other parts of the continent, uh, even the liberal leaders in Britain, uh, particularly inspired by the oratorial and organizational ability of the middle class and artisan radicals at home, uh, they did uh, start uh, uh, clamoring for more and more political power uh, and this movement, this middle class movement uh, for reform uh, further intensified uh, after 1830. Uh, in fact, the current was so strong uh, that uh, uh, Tories were toppled and uh, this uh, greatly emboldened the Whigs who were regarded as little more progressive as compared or less uh, conservative as compared to the Tories. Uh, an alliance uh, seems to be emerging here between the middle class industrialists and the artisans or the trade uh, tradesmen leadership uh, of the emerging working class. Remember, uh, this would be frowned upon by the ruling class because uh, if the liberal class uh, comes together with the working class, then uh, the, lay, the then the uh, days of landed interest would be limited. Uh, so they uh, they get uh, alarmed by this, and this alliance between the uh, 
between the uh, entrepreneurial class and the artisans and so forth and the working class assumed threatening proportions particularly in cities like Birmingham, Glasgow, Manchester, Liverpool, Sheffield, Newcastle and so forth. Uh, and uh, there are uh, efforts and uh, measures like determination to hold taxes, uh, spread of cholera further uh, deteriorated or intensified uh, that sense of unrest and uh, social disorder. So, all these things uh, were viewed by fair degree of suspicion and alarm by the King William IV uh, whose uh, period is 1830 to 37 and he writes worryingly uh, to Lord Grey uh, and I quote miners, manufacturers, colliers, laborers appeared ready for some sort of open rebellion and sensing uh, the dangers associated with the growing alliance the governing class once more accommodated changes which I earlier talked to you about that uh, Br British ruling class is very good at it and uh, sensing this alarm they again came out with uh, a dose of uh, reforms and that is the backdrop of the reform bill of 1832. It gave the middle class a share of political power although electoral districts were uh, uh, not created equally. Electoral districts are like uh, parliamentary constituencies from uh, where uh, a representative is elected to the house of commons. So, that was made that was worked out in such a way that uh, that favored the landlords more as compared to the uh, middle class. Even the increased franchise uh, uh, right to vote uh, uh, increased uh, to not uh, more than 3 percent of the total population. So, uh, even uh, enfranchisement was a slow process and uh, not uh, to the expectation of the middle class. Seats were redistributed to increase the political power of the industrial north as compared to the rural south. So, that division uh, is also sought to be uh, uh, made between the industrial uh, uh, sections of the middle class and the uh, rural south uh, from where uh, the working class artisanal uh, section came. Overall therefore, the 1832 reforms are seen as a conservative measure. It only reduced and not destroyed the strength of the landed aristocratic interests. It preserved the notion of representation by interest, liberal industrial middle class uh, emerged to be operating as a junior partner with the landed oligarchy till around this period. And it is only subsequently that you find uh, uh, the middle class actually emerging or uh, uh, coming out of the fold uh, of uh, the landed uh, oligarchical control in terms of uh, uh, political access to power. But till around this uh, uh, point of time, that is the scenario that existed in Britain. Thank you.